Hello, and welcome to the second session of the contributed talks to hear about different applications using DNA sequencing to understand and conserve biodiversity. My name is <clears throat> Mara Lanazak, and I'll be chairing this session, which is focused on DNA barcoding applications. We're going to hear from Vanessa Mata, Ethan Ross, Tom Wilding, Thomas Ravitch, and Natasha Devere, and then we'll have an open Q&A with the speakers. So please do send your questions in tagging the speaker or speakers you'd like to hear from. See you shortly. Hi everyone, my name is Vanessa and I'm a researcher from CBU BioPolish. I have been working mostly with dietary studies using DNA metabar coding, but today I will be talking about the use of uh, this technique for the study of nocturnal insects. So, as you know, there's evidence that insects are declining worldwide with many groups like bees, butterflies and moths showing rapid declines. Um, land use change and in particular agriculture has been pointed as one of the main drivers of this decline, but climate change and invasive species are likely to play major roles in the next years. And more than losing species richness, we are likely to observe major changes in communities with shifts in species composition and abundance, as well as in functional groups and traits. However, monitoring insects is not an easy task um, due to their huge taxonomic diversity and the need of expert taxonomists, which for a number of reasons are a rarity these days. Also, to fully understand the effect of anthropogenic drivers, large sample sizes are often required, which further difficults the job of ecologists. So how can we move forward? So DNA metabar coding has come up as a valuable approach to study arthropod communities, as it allows multiple species to be identified from a comp complex mixture of specimens. There have been several methodological developments in how this is best achieved, but the end message is that the method can be used to study a large number of sites over repeated and long time periods, while obtaining high taxonomic resolution for a wide diversity of arthropods, thus allowing us to study ecological gradients over time. So I will now present you a case study in which we were interested in understanding how traditional agricultural habitats can contribute to insect conservation. So we assessed how species richness and community composition varied between traditional agricultural and semi non semi-natural habitats, as well as life history traits of these communities varied across um, habitats. So we conducted our study in Northeast Portugal within the Tua Valley natural, natural Park, and we selected four habitat types to sample. Uh, two agricultural habitats, so vineyards and olive groves, and two semi-natural habitats, cork oak woodlands and uh, riparian galleries. So fieldwork was carried for five consecutive days on each summer month using light traps with um, solar sensors, which were active from sunset to sunrise. And in the end, the bags that were within the bucket containing the insects were frozen at minus 20 degrees and specimens were then transferred to tubes uh, with ethanol. In the lab, samples were dried and grind it to obtain a uh, homogenized powder. And up to three extraction replicates were performed uh, per sample. They were then amplified through PCR using general arthropod primers targeting CO1 and sequenced in a Illumina uh, platform and then bioinformatically processed. So moving on to results. From the 144 samples, we were able to detect 20 uh, orders of arthropods belonging to over 170 families, from which we could identify more than 650 species, and from those, more than, uh, more than 400 of those were uh, moths. So regarding OTU diversity, uh, both habitat and season play the role in species richness, and we can see that uh, olive groves in July uh, recorded um, highest values, while the lowest values uh, were recorded in vineyards in September. 
However, when comparing these two um, distinctiveness, which is related with phylogenetic diversity of the arthropods present in the sample, we can see that the pattern is uh, slightly different. So riverine areas uh, show the, um, the highest uh, values in both um, seasons, okay? And in this case, uh, unlike with species richness, you can see the same pattern in both seasons, while here the most diverse uh, habitat depends on the season which is then, of course, supported by our statistical uh, tests. So regarding species composition, although there were uh, significant differences between habitats and seasons, with some species being more common in cork oak woodlands and others in vineyards, time played a major role in the structure of our communities. So these are samples collected in July, and these are samples collected in September. And you can see that this is the major uh, structuring factor um, in our samples. Um, so this highlights how careful we need to be when monitoring and comparing insect communities, as their seasonal fluctuations are really well defined and might obscure results when we're trying to make comparisons that are not made in equivalent timeframes. So moving on to life traits and how they vary across habitats, we can see that uh, larger species are present in September and in cork oak and uh, riverine uh, habitats. Also cork oak woodlands presented uh, more um, monophagous uh, species, so species that are more specialists and uh, overall July showed more um, polyphagous species and September more uh, detritivorous uh, species. So to wrap up, as expected, uh, metabar coding allowed us to achieve a high sampling effort in space and time, providing us high taxonomic resolution and specimen identification, which further allowed us to infer traits and assess how they are affected by anthropogenic impacts. I have to add that what I presented here is the result of a master thesis in which the student participated in field work, helped in the lab, compiled all the moth traits and performed the statistical analysis. So this would have been virtually impossible to do with uh, traditional taxonomic methods and the amount and time and expertise required to process all those samples and specimens could take years and years of the student's life. And this really showcases how this kind of methods can speed up our, our understanding uh, of insect communities. Of course, as any method, the DNA metabar coding is not perfect. So for now, we're still unable to easily estimate species abundances or biomass, and the success of species identification is hugely dependent on the existence of comprehensive DNA reference collections which for moths are quite okay, but for many super diverse groups like beetles and flies are still far uh, behind. So to conclude, we found that species richness varies between habitats and seasons, while distinctiveness also varied across habitats, but similarly across seasons. Species composition varied slightly across habitats with some species occurring more often or being exclusive of agricultural habitats, but communities were mostly structured by temporal patterns. Finally, species traits varied across habitats, which might have important impacts on ecosystem services. So even though we already can make some inferences with this data, we did a more extended version of the study over a six month period, collecting the total of 570 samples, which we are currently analyzing and hope to publish soon. So follow up and thank you for listening. I will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ethan and welcome to my talk on the work I've been doing um, uh, with DNA barcoding of um, seagrass associated biodiversity and the use of optical nanopore sequencing in that. And thanks to BG23 for inviting me to present. Um, so just a quick introduction to the habitats I work on. So I work on Scottish seagrass beds, incredibly biodiverse habitats, hundreds of different species, always a pleasure to visit. Um, but this biodiversity is super important. So the seagrass um, 
sort of supports multiple ecosystem services. Um, the big one mentioned a lot is so really good at drawing down atmospheric carbon and storing that. Um, what's not so great, though, is the fact that we've lost 39% of our seagrass since the 1980s here in the UK. Um, but there is now legislation in place to protect that seagrass, and there's um, an increasing number of active restoration projects all around the coast. So that's really great. So in terms of my PhD project, um, I look at molecular methods for monitoring seagrass biodiversity. So the first part of that is uh, DNA barcoding. So far, I've been focusing on the um, cytochrome oxidase 1 region. Um, but it's the hopes that generating uh, DNA barcodes for species that I found on seagrass can then be used as reference sequences for um, some eDNA metabarcoding work that I'm going to be doing, um, where I'm comparing different eDNA substrates, um, filtered water samples and sediment samples, um, and seeing how the estimates of species richness um, differ depending on the method. But for now, for this presentation, we're focusing mainly on the barcoding side of things. So when I started the project, um, I just wanted a quick overview of the CO1 barcode coverage for seagrass associated invertebrates. So I got a big list of all the invertebrate species that have been found on seagrass in the UK, and then worked out uh, which of them already had CO1 barcodes and which of them didn't. Uh, and I was using bold as a kind of reference. And um, you can see it's pretty good, like a lot of species already have CO1 barcodes, but there's still quite a few gaps represented by the gray bars. So still work to be done. So uh, trying to fill some of those gaps, I've been collecting uh, invertebrates from seagrass beds on the west coast of Scotland. I've been ide uh, identifying them morphologically, um, ideally to species level. And then DNA barcoding, so pulling tissue, extracting DNA, um, amplifying the CO1 barcode and getting that sequenced. Uh, I began the project using Sanger sequencing, which is still kind of the gold standard for DNA barcoding. Uh, but I was quickly introduced to Oxford nanopore sequencing as a potential alternative um, based on these two seminal papers, first of which in 2021 developed a tool called ONT Barcoder, which I'll be using and explain um, later down uh, in this talk. So as a first case study, I picked uh, 68 of these specimens to be sequenced, representing 44 morpho species. And I wanted to compare two metrics um, between the Sanger and the um, Oxford Nanopore uh, sequences. First is sequence similarity. So if you get a Sanger sequence, is it the same as a sequence you get from Oxford Nanopore, uh, given the same specimen? And also recovery rate. Um, so how many sequences do you actually get back that are useful from either method? So in terms of quick methods for Sanger sequencing, it was pretty classic. So um, PCR using universal primers, no tags or anything. Um, once I got an amplicon, cleaned that up with a PCR cleanup kit, sent it off for Sanger sequencing, so sent off the forward and reverse read. And then once they were returned to me, um, I trimmed them, removed the primers, and created a contig uh, in Genius. And if the sequence came rubbish after the off, I repeated the PCR and repeated the process to try and get better, a better sequence. And for the LNT, this data is based on two runs that I've done. So um, used the same primers as I did for the Sanger sequencing, but this time they were tagged, which I'll talk about in a minute. And um, once I got tagged amplicons, I pulled them uh, and ran them through an R10 uh, flongle. Uh, base called using Guppy, and then uh, the base called reads were put through ONT barcoder, which separates them um, back out into individual species based on the tag combinations. So uh, PCR with the tag primers, what does that look like? It's just the same universal primers for CO1. So in this case, it's LCO and um, HCO. But uh, on the end of the primer sequence are 13 base pair tags. Um, and I got these tags from um, the Cuba et uh, 2023 paper. So I've been doing my PCRs in plates, and then O represents a unique tag combination, which corresponds to a unique species. So again, flongal sequencing. So flongals are the single-use sort of medium output flow cells from Oxford nanopore. Um, so very up-to-date chemistry. Uh, again, um, base called through Guppy and then put through ONT barcoder. And briefly, how ONT Barcoder works is it creates a consensus sequence based on the reads, um, first by length. So if they're the same length, it will try and condense them into a fair census. If they differ in length, it will try and do it based on sequence similarity. So sequences that are like more than 90% similar will try and be condensed. And in a situation where it looks like you've introduced things like stop codons, it will attempt to fix the barcode sequence um, artificially. So results. Uh, of the 68 specimens, I recovered 63 Sanger sequences for them, um, which is pretty good. Uh, but the ONT recovery was actually 67, so all but one, which is um, a little bit better. 
Um, of the two methods, I got 62 sequences, um, sorry, 62 specimens had a sequence from both methods. 50 of those are just identical to each other, so no differences. 59 were more than 99% similar. So that equates to um, one to four base pair differences between the two methods. And three were just awful. And these three really represent kind of rubbish in, rubbish out. So it was either bacterial contamination or um, some symbiont that really caused either the Sanger and also the ONT sequence to just be pretty poor and low sequence similarity. Um, I was also interested to see the impact of amplicon concentration input into the into the ONT. So I uh, artificially diluted several PCR products. Um, and you can see here um, that as you increase amplicon concentration um, input um, per specimen, you increase the number of sequences you demultiplex, which makes sense. Um, the green line represents 25 reads, which is approximately what ONT barcode uh, suggests you need to get a good consensus sequence. So if you want 25 or more reads, based on this, typically you need input con five or more nanogram per microliter. Now switching that onto the x-axis, so that red dotted line represents that 25 read threshold again. Now I'm looking at number of ambiguous spaces. So if you don't have enough copies to make a consensus sequence, ONT barcode will start introducing ends or ambiguous spaces into your sequences. And again, if it looks like if you have less than 25 sequences per specimen, you start incorporating these ambiguous spaces, which ideally you don't want. Um, a quick thing that ONT has over Sanger sequence um, is the ability to deal with misamplification. So in these scenarios, imagine these are lanes and a gel, and you've amplified multiple products in your PCR. This is usually a death sentence for Sanger sequencing, because they all get jumbled up, a sequence together, and you're chromatogram looks awful. Um, but for ONT, if you sequence these, you actually get both products. So you get the products you want and the majority here, the products you don't want. And you can actually use a, uh, an existing reference sequence or a reference sequence of a species that's closely related to actually pull the reads that you actually want out of that big pool. So actually sequences that will come back as, as rubbish from Sanger sequences actually can be um, kind of retained um, using the ONT, which is a pretty good bonus. So overall, I've generated 67 C1 barcodes from seagrass associated macroinvertebrates so far. I've got about 200, 300 more specimens to go through, but this is just a starting point. Um, so far, based on the comparison, I've got high sequence similarity between the two methods. So more than 80% of them are identical. It's pretty good going. And the ONT showed higher recovery rate than the Sanger sequence. Um, it's also pretty good. So combined, I think this is really a good case to use uh, ONT um, sequencing using Flongles as an alternative to Sanger sequencing, depending on the scale of your project. Um, obviously, if you've got hundreds of specimens, it might be more suitable than if you just had a handful. Uh, thanks to my funders, the coastal community that have helped with the field work hosting me, and also uh, three of the undergrads that have been helping me with field work too. And here are some references for the papers I've made reference to. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, my name is Tom Wilding. I'm going to be talking about environmental monitoring using bacterial metabarcoding. And I work in Scotland in the UK for the Scottish Association for Marine Science. So my talk will cover the following. I'll give a little bit of background context, talk about fish farming in Scotland, and then the Water Framework Directive and traditional compliance monitoring. I'll then go and talk about go on to talk about eDNA based alternatives and our approach to eDNA sampling, library prep, uh, some technical details, and uh, then go on to talk about the results, uh, comparing eDNA versus traditional impact assessment. And I'll then mention some of the key tacks that we've identified in this process with a few summary and concluding comments at the end. So in terms of context then, fish farming in Scotland is a major industry. A turnover is approximately one billion pounds. And fish farming though impacts the environment mainly via the deposition of faeces from the fish onto the seabed around the fish cages. The spatial extent and the scale of the impact is regulated under the newly implemented Water Framework Directive within the, Scot the Scottish regulatory sector. The key regulatory metric 
uh, in this is the Uniformal Quality Index, or the IQI. So benthic monitoring around Scottish fish farms involves the collection of sediment uh, using a Van Veen grab, as illustrated here. So this is the traditional method, and it requires the uh, analysis of grab samples. So the sample is sieved, the macrobenthic organisms are identified and counted to, gen to generate this informal quality index, the IQI. So the sample is passed through the sieve, the fine material is washed out, leaving the macrobenthos. So here we have a, a, a sample which indicates a low diversity, a high abundance of individual organisms, and this would have a low IQI score. And this is mostly Capitella and Malacocorus to uh, enrichment polychaete species. At the other end of this spectrum, we've got a higher diversity uh, assemblage here with lower overall abundance, and this would have a higher IQI, and this includes uh, the brittle star and the Eura. Now, there are issues with macrobenthic based monitoring in Scotland. Grab sampling and macrobenthic analysis is time consuming and it requires considerable taxonomic expertise from a declining pool of taxonomic experts in order to generate uh, the IQI. As a consequence of the uh, complexity of this process, the macrobenthic results typically arrive two to four months after the sample has been taken, by which time the site is fallowed. And this prevents any sort of active management of that site from, the, from this approach. And the adoption of the Water Framework Directive regulations are exacerbating these problems by increasing the number of samples required from an, for analysis from six to about 28 samples per production cycle. So what about using eDNA as an alternative to macrobenthic analysis? This is predicated on successfully linking eDNA metrics to metrics used in regulation, and that metric is the IQI. You still need a benthic sample for this though, only it's 500 milligrams for a typical eDNA-based analysis versus about 20 kilograms in a benthic grab. Happily, eDNA sampling is relatively straightforward. You just take samples from the top of the grab. We take six subsamples, um, uh, three subsamples from each side of the grab to integrate across the grab variability. And once taken, these samples are stored on ice in the dark and then frozen. Some technical details then. Our eDNA is extracted using proprietary soil kits. And we uh, amplify the 16S V3, V4 uh, section of DNA uh, using standard 16S primers. We use aluminum iSeq V3 chemistry and a standard data to denoise with annotation against the silver database. Most of our ASVs are unassigned at the species level, so we collate upwards to family level. To recap then, we are taking samples, benthic grabs, we're sieving those, extracting the macroinvertebrates, identifying those under a microscope to derive our biotic index. Simultaneously, as part of our research program, we are taking eDNA samples from those same grabs, extracting and amplifying the 16S um, marker, identifying the bacteria, and we're using a random forest to find patterns that link, that best link the patterns in the eDNA with the uh, IQI. So in terms of the random forest, it's a method for predicting outcomes based on patterns in numerous predictors. And we are training our random forest to link patterns in those bacterial families identified from the eDNA to the IQI. Now the random forest outputs the top taxa, those are bacterial families that it identifies as being key to making the predictions. Preliminary results from this then. So here we have the um, uh, two sites, site A and C, uh, and we have four transects along which samples have been taken at these uh, two sites, transects one, two, three, and four. We've got distance from the cage edge on the x-axis, and the predicted and actual IQI values on the y-axis. And this is what our results look like. The predicted values are shown in pink, the actual values are shown in blue. And the main take-home message from this 
is that the predicted and actual uh, IQI values uh, align very closely. And there's a very steep increase uh, in the IQI as a function of distance from the cage edge. In terms of understanding the predicted power of the uh, random forest, we could look or we can use the random forest to identify a key taxa. And most of the key taxa that are identified uh, in the random forest show strong linear correlations um, with the IQI. So here we have the IQI on the y-axis and the log re read count for these individual families of bacteria on the x-axis. Many of the key taxa that are identified are involved in sulfur metabolism. And some of these, uh, as indicated here, some of these are sulfate reducing or likely to include sulfate reducing bacteria and others are likely to include sulfide oxidizing bacteria. Furthermore, we can uh, look at the relationship between individual macrobenthic, uh, uh, individual members of the macrobenthos. So this is Capitella here, Malacocris and Amphiura against all of those families that are identified as being key. So here we can see that uh, Capitella and Malacocris, for example, are negatively correlated to this particular family here indicating that this family is in indicative of higher IQI scores. So we can link our um, eDNA-based approach back down to, or back around to the macrobenthic community. To summarize then, regulatory changes have increased the macrobenthic analysis demand beyond the current sector's capacity to deliver that. And we have shown that our random forests trained on corresponding bacterial patterns can accurately predict macrobenthic metrics. Furthermore, the key bacterial indicator taxa included or include many that are linked to sulfur metabolism and key macrobenthic groups. And our eDNA-based monitoring approach is being adopted by the Scottish regulator. I would like to acknowledge all these people and all these organizations. Uh, they've all contributed to uh, this analysis and I'll take any questions when appropriate. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Tomasz Rewicz and I am part of the Michał Grabowski lab from University of Łódź. And we are part of the Polish Bar of Life Initiative and also BGE Consortium. And today I would like to present um, our studies about DNA barcoding of aquatic heterocterans in the uh, Balkan Biodiversity hotspot in the ancient Lake Skadar. Why it is worth to present? Because Skadar Lake is the largest lake on the Balkan Peninsula, and the lake itself is quite unique, which because it is a really young lake because it emerged uh, only twelve centuries ago, but on the area uh, where the really old spring system, which is three million years old existing. So all those springs were flooded and the lake emerged as we can see it right now. And it's really unique level of biodiversity and is well-known hotspot with the high uh, level of endemicity, especially in the macroinvertebrates uh, which are living there. So, we are doing studies with cooperation of uh, with University of Montenegro since 2014. It's formal cooperation, and before we were visiting the area and conducting informal cooperation with our dear friend Vladimir Pesic, which is conducting study there from University of Montenegro, and this studies uh, was co-funded by project that what the patient got from the Ministry of Science of Montenegro and also with the support of Center for Biodiversity Genomics from Guelph and University of Łódź. And the area itself is really beautiful because as I said, it's shallow lake with a lot of different springs. Some of them are really big, some of them are tiny, but all of them are beautiful. And our sampling effort was 
quite good, I must say, because we covered almost all available habitats, different ones in the area of lake and the surrounding area itself, but also of the catchment and the surroundings. And our study accelerated in 2019, uh, when with Piotr Gadawski, uh, we moved to Center for Biodiversity Genomics for a uh, one year research internship. And uh, during this stay, we barcoded um, material from this area, from the lake itself and surrounding area. We generated almost 16,000 barcodes from Montenegro and Albania. Uh, most of them were from arthropods, but also some mollusks, mollusks and annelids. And up to now, we have 638 species identified and also 1,791 beans assigned. So our previous involvement um, in the area, our previous um, results were um, published in some papers, uh, especially focused on hieronomics, which was the topic of the Piotr Gadawski thesis, uh, also crustacean, which is the major aim of Michał Grabowski team, and also some general papers about uh, macro um, bentos, zoobentos, and also uh, other groups. And for now we would like to focus uh, on the aquatic heteropterans, uh, which we published this summer, and we picked the results from our long-term studies and what we have there. We generated 220 barcodes uh, from uh, 24 species which were assigned to 28 beans and from this result we already see two four new species to, for Montenegro fauna, one species new to Albania and new uh, nine new species to the Scudder Lake area. Uh, which means it's 60% of increase of known species in the lake itself. And probably we found one new species of uh, value. And when we compare the results uh, with European data set of aquatic heteropterans, um, it appeared that for four species, we generated the barcodes for the first time. And we also generated four new beans for well-known species. And from the uh, result itself, in case of three species, um, we found some uh, nice patterns because we found uh, two beans in the Scudder Lake area. And in case of Hydrometros tagnorum, one bean was uh, unique for area of the lake. But the second one was the one which was already known from the central uh, western and northern part uh, of of Europe, because what we see on the maps on the right is the occurrence data uh, based on GBIF on the upper map and uh, available data, molecular data barcodes uh, for Hydrometros tagnorum in the lower map, and we really see the scarcity of those results. Uh, for the Nepa cinerea, we also found two beans in the Scudder Lake area. One was limited only to area of the lake, uh, but the second one was the one uh, which also occurring in the central and northern uh, Europe, in Finland, Germany, and Poland. In the Natonect maculata, uh, also two beans and they are both limited uh, to the Skadar Lake region. And in most of the cases, especially in this tree that we present here, we see the scarcity of molecular data uh, from quite big common aquatic insects. So we are not even talking about some small creatures from the dark taxa itself. So summarizing, uh, we provided the first comprehensive uh, DNA barcode library of aquatic heteroptera. We extended the list of species known from the area by 
uh, I mean by the lake. And we also notice new species uh, for the countries and new beans uh, for the, let's say, European library. And we see that this hotspot, which is the Skadar Lake, is really understudied. And it's really a threat because the area there is threatened by many different factors. Um, and the knowledge about the macroinvertebrates, it's still really understudied and we need to do much more and much faster. And thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Natasha Devere. I'm going to be talking about unraveling plant pollinator interactions using pollen DNA metabarcoding. As we know, uh, pollinators are facing many threats, pests and diseases, loss of habitat, climate change, insecticide, agricultural intensification are causing declines in wild pollinators and ill health in managed honeybees. And loss of flower rich habitat is one of the key factors that we know are causing problems. So that means that if we know in more detail what floral resources are important for pollinators, we can provide those within the landscape. In order to find out what plants are important for pollinators, well, of course, we can use observation. But actually, we can also use DNA metabarcoding of pollen, which we can retrieve from the bodies of insects, from pollen loads or from honey. And we've shown that uh, DNA metabarcoding can increase the temporal and spatial coverage, the taxonomic resolution, and allow us to track individuals more easily than if we use observation approaches alone. The process that we go through is, first of all, we collect the pollen from honey or from the bodies of insect, extract the DNA and amplify using RBCL and ITS2 DNA barcode markers. After sequencing, we compare those results to a reference library. And the reference library is really important in terms of making accurate identifications. I'm going to give you some examples of work we've done in the UK. But the first thing we did was make a barcode reference library where we DNA barcoded all of the flowering plants of the UK. So I'm going to give you some examples, first of all, using honeybees, which are very amenable to study because the hives are located in um, one place. We can collect honey samples very easy to find out what plants the honeybees are using. So one of our studies uh, looked across the whole of the UK and we collected honey samples from beekeepers in 2017. We then compared that to the 1950s uh, and a survey that was conducted then and calibrated so that we could compare microscopy in the 1950s to DNA within 2017. And so what were honeybees doing and how had that differed over time? Well, from the 1950s to the present day, uh, similar plants were used by the honeybees and there was positive correlation between the occurrence of those plants over the time periods. The same four plants occurred in more than 50% of samples. Rubus fruticosus, which is blackberry. Brassica, which we think was mostly oilseed rape, Brassica napus. Uh, Trifolium repens, which is white clover and a group which contained a hawthorn, apple and cotoneaster. So although the plants sort of used by the honeybees was quite similar over those periods, we did see significant differences between the proportion and the frequency of the plants used by the honeybees. And this related to changes in the availability of those plants within the landscape. In the 1950s, white clover, Trifolium repens, was by far the most important plant for honeybees within honey samples. But by 2017, the white clover um, had decreased and was replaced on the top spot by um, Rubus fruticosus. And we believe this reflects changes in the agricultural landscape. Uh, wild flower meadows and flower-rich grasslands, which would have contained more white clover 
decreased as we started to use more inorganic fertilizers and herbicides. As silage production increased, we lost many of our wild flower meadows and white clover decreased alongside those. We also tracked uh, the increase of a new crop. So Brassica napa soil seed rape only really started to be grown from the 1970s onwards in the UK. And honeybees use significantly more of it as it becomes available. And the honeybees also track the increase of an invasive species, Himalayan balsam or Impatiens glandulifera. This was present in the 1950s in much lower about amounts, but it's now really abundant uh, within the landscape across watercourses and the edges of rivers. It can cause problems for the uh, original vegetation of the site and it can block up waterways, but it's actually also really important for pollinators. It provides an important late season nectar source. The honeybees used significantly more of it in 2017 compared to the 1950s. And we can also drill down in more detail to look at the colony level to see what honeybees are getting up to. Um, in this example here, we look throughout um, the seasons from April to August, um, and we're looking at just six different uh, honeybee colonies within an apiary. So on the charts here, you can see the different months. And on the left hand side, H1 to 6 represents the different honeybee colonies. The plants the honeybees are using are shown on the right hand side and the width of the band is the abundance of those plants within the DNA samples. And if we have a look at July and August, we can see by far the most abundant plants that are being used are Rubus fruticosus, uh, blackberry and Trifolium repens white clover. So completely corresponding to the results that we found for the UK on a much wider scale. But if we have a look at June, something completely different is happening. There's lots and lots of different plants being used and all the honeybee colonies are using different resources. And this actually reflects resource limitation. There's not one single preferred resource which the honeybees are able to access. This relates to periods where less honey is produced. And actually, we sometimes need to supplementary feed honeybee colonies at this time. Beekeepers have known about this for many years. They call it the June gap. But it's interesting that using pollen DNA metabarcoding, we can track at a very detailed level the floral resource use in honeybees, but also wild pollinators. Uh, we looked more broadly at uh, different pollinator groups. So in this example here, within the Botanical Garden and Nature Reserve, which was next door in the National Botanic Garden of Wales, we carried out transects and sampled pollinators again throughout the season. And we compared um, what bumblebees, um, honeybees, solitary bees and hoverflies were getting up to. And we found that there were certain plants which were important for all of the different groups of pollinators. But we did see significant differences between the hoverflies and the bees, for example. The bees really liked thistles and the hoverflies really liked umbellifers. So these are in the family Apiaceae. We can even track in more detail within different types of bees, such as short-tongued and long-tongued bees. As you would expect, short-tongued bees have diets which are more similar to honeybees. We even showed that depending on the larval food type of hoverflies, um, there's then a significant difference in the adults in terms of what plants they forage. So we can start to really have a lot of detail in terms of the interactions that we see. And we've used this to make recommendation um, for gardeners. So if we know what plants are being used, we can ask gardeners to provide those. We know it's really important to provide food throughout the season, particularly at the beginning and the end. Many of our pollinators use more native and near native plants. We know that Rubus fruticosus, blackberry is important. We need to make that available within the landscape. And we need to make good choices for plants um, and pollinators and the planet and not use peat and pesticides. Thank you.
Thank you very much to all the speakers for some very interesting talks. We will go over to the questions now. Um, the first question is for Ethan from Pete Hollingsworth. Ethan, can you say more about the plans to use the reference barcodes for biomonitoring of seagrass beds, including assessments of seagrass restoration pro pro projects? Uh, yeah, sure. So I suppose that kind of <clears throat> goes beyond my talk and more towards the sort of latter chapters of my PhD. But um, what I did mention was that um, the invertebrates that I've collected for the barcoding work have been collected alongside eDNA samples. So they've been collected alongside sediment and also water samples. So the kind of idea is that I get a reference library generated for the invertebrates that were actually present at the time I was sampling the eDNA. So there's that kind of paired look. Not only do I have an understanding of roughly what invertebrates were present on the seagrass bed, but also kind of their sequences should be represented in the eDNA. Maybe it's not the exact same individual, but certainly the same species should be represented in the eDNA. And I suppose, yeah, that's the idea uh, to generate kind of a routine biomonitoring tool for seagrass restoration. A lot of the sites I've been to are doing restoration kind of alongside I was collecting uh, when I was collecting my my data. Um, I guess the difference with the water, the water eDNA stuff is going to be how close those sites are if they're right next to each other, which is often the case. You don't transplant seagrass on a place that, you know, historically there was no seagrass. Um, maybe you'd pick up kind of some contamination between like a really healthy site and a newly restored site. Um, so I suppose there's some work to be done there. But um, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Thank you, Ethan. Our next question is for Vanessa. What proportion of your barcode sequence data had no match in the public databases and how big do you think the gap barcoded versus not barcoded is? Question. I mean, because this study was conducted in Europe, the percentage of things not identified was actually quite low. So like 95%, you could get an order level identification. And overall, we got 50% um, of species level identification. But of course, if this was done outside of Europe, the scenario <laughs> wouldn't be so optimistic. And for example, if we focus on moths, uh, the percentage of things identified to species level increases to 87%, which is much better than, than the 50%. So of course, this varies a lot depending on the group that we're talking about. Thank you, Vanessa. Our next question is for Tom from Rob Waterhouse. Tom, who pays for the eDNA monitoring of the fishery sites and how much does the industry does industry agree on what we as scientists should be delivering to them? Is it hard to convince them to use genomics? Well, who pays? Well, the, the fish farm companies themselves pay for the sampling. Um, they are obliged under regulations to conduct um, compliance assessments in relation to the macrobenthos, or well, in relation to the macrobenthos. Um, so, I mean, we're working very much with the fish farm companies and the regulators to develop this alternative methodology, um, which will be more cost effective than the traditional macrobenthic analysis. So replacing macrobenthic analysis with an eDNA based approach is both uh, more cost effective uh, and it's much faster. So um, we're working with both the regulator and the industry to, to develop this technique. How much faster is it? Well, I mean, it depends on. Well, yeah, it depends a bit, but but tradition. The traditional approach is um, two to four months to get the macrobenthic analysis completed. Um, you can do an eDNA based analysis in a, in a couple of weeks, um, and it, and at a push, you, you could you could do it even quicker than that if you've got enough samples to go on the plate. Depends on how much money you want to spend on the on the eDNA based approach. But it enables that the, the eDNA based approach will be enabling sort of near real time assessment and and the and the and the farming companies will be able to sort of assess their um, their trajectories of, of um, uh, changing benthic environment in, in near real time. Uh, and this will help ensure that they don't exceed their regulatory consent levels. There's another question for you also about how easy you think it will be to formally incorporate eDNA analysis into the regula regulatory framework. Can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, well, it is. it has already been done. So um, eDNA-based approach is are an option for the sector at the moment. So CEPA, it was CEPA which is our uh, national regulator, have um, over the last few months just introduced that. Um, that's on the back of a pilot program that we ran. And the current program is developing um, 
developing that uh, pilot program in, in much more detail. So we're some, we're taking um, or we will be taking about a thousand samples over a range of um, sedimentary conditions in order to train our random forest optimally. And then we will be optimizing that random forest and incorporating that into the back bar package, which is called eDNA to IQI, uh, which we're writing as part of our project. Uh, and that um, package will be made available um, for free on, on GitHub. Great. Do you need abundance data as well as presence absence data to calculate IQI? Well, you do to calculate it as part uh, in the traditional macrobenthic way. Yes. So uh, you would normally um, collect a grab and, and then count up all of the animals and identify them. And that's that's why it's so laborious, because you can get literally thousands of thousands of uh, enrichment polychaetes in a, in a single sample and somebody's got to, to count each individual one of those. That's why it takes months. Um, our eDNA based approach is is a, is a pattern matching approach, so it, it doesn't require. Um, it it, it um, we're using the the number of reads um, per um, bacterial family to to sort of uh, to, to to make that linkage between the IQI and the bacterial family. So there's no in a sense there's no counting um, required of of the back, uh, of the eDNA based approach. Thanks, Tom. Now a question for Tomish uh, from Pete Hollingsworth. Do you have a sense of for the percent of known species to actual number of species for the aquatic heteroptera in your system based on the barcode data? So in uh, the Scudder Lake area, we have 24 species. And after we summarized uh, the data in Europe, apparently is around 147. So it's not, let's say, uh, really share of the all available species in Europe. Uh, comparing to Balkans, we have 83 species, so it's, let's say about one third of that. But we have still a lot of gaps because when we uh, uh, check for the, the available uh, sequences, the barcodes, so from, from Europe, uh, we have data only for 81 species from this 147 uh, at all, so we still let's say, on the low level of of, 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 of checking of uh, what is known in Europe. And another question for you, Tomasz, from Dora Hebeck. Um, I agree that Lake Skadar has exceptional biodiversity, but it is not the only such area in the Balkans. Are other areas, such as the Dinaric Karst, etc., included in your project? You generated nearly 16,000 barcodes and 600 species. How many taxonomic specialists were involved? Okay, so we focus, of course, on the Scudder Lake area because we are conducting, conducting the studies there from oh, many years already, probably more than 15 right now. And we cooperate with Wado Peshits, who have really no peoples there, and it's available to uh, collect the data and be there uh, quite often. Uh, so our uh, sampling campaigns was not only 2018, but also like six or seven trips before. So let's say our material from there is the, the most abundant. Uh, of course, we also know that in the uh, rest of the Balkans there are um, a lot of hotspots and we have quite nice data set from uh, Croatia, from uh, freshwater uh, crustaceans, because our colleagues, Michel Jedic and Kresos Ganets collected it and, and barcoded in our laboratory in Łódź. So yeah, yeah, we, we know, and maybe we can compare it uh, later on, but you know, the amount of data we generated is is really huge. So to the next part of this question, uh, fortunately, we still have quite a nice background in our department, in our colleagues uh, about the taxonomy of freshwater macroinvertebrates. And our colleague Grzegorz, he is responsible, let's say, for uh, heteropterans, uh, odonates. Uh, our next colleague, Roman Godunko, he is, I think, one of the best top specialists in, in Europe from the ephemeropterans, plecopterans, trichopterans. And Piotr Gadawski, he is dealing really good with the hieronomids. So I think quite a lot of these uh, major groups we can covert by, let's say, our um, own effort. But of course, it's really time consuming. So most of the matches that we have right now, 
they are from, uh, let's say, some kind of obvious species that we can identify uh, quite fast because Grzegorz uh, did this uh, first, let's say, check for the, the whole material. And, and the rest of that is this automatic uh, identification from the bolt system. But uh, that's why we are not, let's say, publishing everything as it is, but we are rather uh, focusing on some parts to not only depend on this, let's say, reverse taxonomy from the board, but also of the um, good uh, morphological ID yeah, before we, we publish it. But of course, there are still some groups that we have to find some people. But yeah. the time is always the limiting factor. Thank you, Thomas. All right, a few questions for you, Natasha. Are you um, from Pete Hollingsworth? Are you picking up wind pollinated species as well as the insect pollinated species that the pollinators are directly visiting? Yeah, we do pick up some wind pollinated species, but actually very low amounts, um, as you would expect from like a low level, except sometimes. Um, so, for example, we've shown that honeybees actually use certain grass species as a source of pollen um, and then we'll pick up much higher amounts of it. And then we got a documentation that actually this is something that, that they do. Um, so it, it tracks really nicely. And a question from Gabriela Denkova. You mentioned that you provide recommendations for gardeners. Do you see engagement with these recommendations from the community and are any changes implemented? Yeah, absolutely. So the work that I presented was part of a big project called Saving Pollinators. And a key aspect of this was not just, OK, what plants do pollinators use? But how do we use that information we find and how do we make that available to people and ask people to engage with it? So we did lots of public engagement, as you'd expect. But we also did something called the uh, Saving Pollinators Assurance Scheme, where we worked with nurseries uh, in Wales that were growing the plants, which we uh, discovered were good for pollinators based on the meta barcoding results. Um, but these nurseries were also having to grow those plants without peat or um, synthetic insecticides. Um, and then we made a logo, uh, which meant that that plant was good for pollinators based on our research, also grown without peat and pesticides. And we trialed whether we could use that to um, improve the plants that were available for, for gardeners to buy. Great. A question from Camille Yaron too. You recommend to make more space for bramble because it's the main source of pollen for the bees now. However, what about restoring clover instead? How much would change if homeowners had clover lawns instead of grass ones? Yeah, that is a really, really good question because um, it would make a massive difference. Uh, the area of gardens is huge um, and it is super easy to create a clover lawn. Uh, and actually, if you cr create a lawn with different types of clover, with white and red clover and some of the smaller clover species, you can make something which is good for all different types of bee species. Um, so, yeah, something that's easy to do and I would definitely recommend. Right. Practical advice coming from BG23. Um, okay, one more question for you, Natasha. Um, is it possible to take the need of all pollinators into account and how? If not, isn't there a risk that rare species needs will be overlooked? Yeah, so a big part of the project that we did and it's results that we're just analyzing and writing up at the moment is we did a lot of work to look at um, pollinator groups that have been studied less. So obviously hoverflies, but also the solitary bees and really trying to use pollen metabarcoding to find out what plants they were visiting um, and looking at the degree of specialization and generalization within these different groups as well. Uh, and that worked nicely. And so that's all kind of, um, you know, watch this space for the results of that to come out. Great. I think we are at time. Um, so I want to thank all of you again for giving these really great presentations and enjoy the break and see you shortly. <laughs>